is my screen visible to you yes sir yes okay so welcome back everyone for the fifth day session um, today we will be covering um, an overview about different parallel architectures so we have various parallel architectures nowadays so i'll try to give an overview about and classification etc so just to give an exposure to different architectures i will not go into details of any of them but i'll try to give an overview so that you will try to get an understanding about different architectures and in the rest of the lectures of today's session and the next week sessions there will be details about the entire uh, parallel architectures so this lecture is to just give an overview okay so if you have any questions uh, you can you are free to comment and speak and also sometime in between i'll take i'll see the chat box if you have posted any questions i will take them as and when required okay so let me go to this okay so uh, so far uh, what we have covered in the computer architecture winter school is uh, some computer organization where we talked about uh, single core processors so how the pipelining works and the branch predictions and etc and then we went to the me memory hierarchy we went for the caches and then uh, different uh, issues in cache hierarchy and security issues etc and then on the third day we have covered drams the main memory so and then after that we uh, the fourth day of the session talks about mainly about the performance modeling etc so uh, so far we have mainly talked concerned about single core processor architecture but then uh, why parallel architecture suddenly so for this to understand it there is uh, some law called moore's law what it says that the number of transistors on a chip uh, i see doubles about every 2 years so the number of transistors basically they are kept in, they kept on uh, doubling every 2 years so this graph basically shows that uh, number of transistors on an ic over the year if you can see the x axis is the year and the y axis is the number of transistors you can see that the number of transistors over the year they are almost uh, getting almost uh, about two, uh, every 2 years is getting doubled so the before you see different processor architectures and you see the number of transistors corresponding to that's getting doubled right now uh, what the problem and uh, what the implications okay so if you see uh, the transistor trends and the different parameters with respect to this moore's law you can see though has the uh, uh, in the x axis we are showing you the the year again the y axis showing the number of transistors and also so sorry y axis shows the units and as the process as the number of transistors have kept on increasing so the processor uh, performance has been the single core uh, processor performance has been increasing till up to 2005 and there uh, the problem started coming in so the single core processors have not been performing that well uh, till then they were not, they were performing better because they were able to exploit increasing the number of uh, increasing the frequency of the processor processor core core lock frequency and we are increasing the number of trees also so that's why the processor is also able to perform better but around 2005 uh, there is something happened that is actually the power started becoming a dominant factor this has become power power law has power actually uh, the processor has started hitting the power wall so you cannot simply cope up with uh, putting so many instruments so resistors on a single chip and the so many packing cores if it you put it on a single thing then actually it was dissipating a uh, lot of power and heat so this has led to the evolution of multi core processors so so the moore's law started increasing and because of this moore's law the number of transistors kept on increasing the single core processor has been increasing to some extent uh, for some of years but after several years the uh, power and this heat dissipation has started uh, coming to major role and that has led to the evolution of multi core processors uh, uh, does anyone have any question uh, so there is noise coming from your end okay let me see how can i filter it or uh, let me see if i try to use a different headphones
Uh, is my voice clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is part of the evolution of um, basically having more than one processing code per chip. Now it is possible that you can uh, place more than one, but how you place these processing core elements and the memory respective memory, uh, with respect to that, there are various kinds of parallel hardware that come into picture. So nowadays you have hardware of different types, parallel hardware of different types. So one is of the type multi-core systems. That you have that you see in traditional your computer, and then you also see uh, some of the distributed uh, processing units, which you can see in some of the supercomputers, etc. And you will also see uh, GPU processing units, that is the graphic processing units. These are also parallel hardware. So now we have it has not happened that it has uh, happened uh, all of a sudden, but it took a lot of research and several decades of research uh, to come into several parallel hardware. But each of these hardware actually have certain kind of different execution policies and certain kind of architectures. So uh, the Flint actually has come up with a classification of this complete panel of computer architecture, depending on how the processors and memory laid out, and also uh, how the instructions, uh, different processing units, how the instructions are being executed by this processing. So he classified uh, the computer architectures into four categories. So the first one is called SISD. This is actually called SI single instruction, single data execution manner, where you have uh, each person is executing one single instruction on one data, one data, one data account. Now you also have a second category that is SIND, which is called a single instruction multiple data manner, where you have the same instruction that will be executed by uh, multiple processing cores. But on different data elements. So these are typically the finite integer processors or finite grain data parallel computers, etc. The third category is uh, MIMD, which is actually multiple instructions and multiple data, where different processing cores can execute different instructions. So the number of instructions executed by any processor could be different. The, the processor, each processor can execute different instruction on different data elements. The fourth category is called MIMD. This is Multiple instructions and single data. These are actually uh, traditional. This traditional is not in forward. This is uh, not uh, practical. Okay, so throughout this lecture now, we will focus on uh, the classification of this uh, and spend most of the time in MIMD and SIST. And MIST are not that practical. So uh, SIST uh, requires uh, SIST is some of the Computer architecture detail that we have already covered in the previous lectures. Let's try to uh, go into the different uh, classifications of architecture. So, the first one is called single instruction, single data. So, this is a traditional computer architecture that we have seen so far that implements a uh, universal Turing machine. You have a processing unit and then you have memory and then input and output, and then you have a single processing core. And the single processing code basically receives instruction, single instruction, and the processing code takes the instruction and one data, the data corresponding to it. Suppose if it is an add instruction, it takes the data element, whatever two elements are there, that is considered as one data unit. And then it executes uh, instruction considering those data elements, and then it produces the output. This is a traditional uh, computer architecture that you have seen so far single instruction, single data execution. Uh, a lot of details have already been covered about it. Now, the second type of uh, execution scheme is actually called uh, the architecture uh, scheme is actually SI, which is basically single instruction, multiple data. So, this kind of parallel architecture is there where we have multiple processors. They execute the same instruction, but on each of them operate on a different data. So, just to uh, understand with some uh, maybe real life example. You can see that uh, several dogs, uh, you can see that they are eating, they are performing the same task here. But the task is that they are tasking is basically they are eating. And uh, everybody is eating his own food. Basically, everybody is uh, performing the same operation on a different data. Now, here also, you can see on the right hand side, there is a picture where several people are actually in the board. 
and they are uh, doing the same operation depending on the instruction. Whatever operation uh, one person is trying to do, the other people are also doing the same operation. So it's basically single instruction, multiple data. You can also think of uh, an example uh, in the schools uh, where at the time of prayer, so there is one uh, instructor that gives you the series of instructions and all the people uh, perform those instructions, execute those instructions and uh, with their own hands, the legs, etc. So it's like single instruction is given to all the processing cores and everybody works on its own different data elements that it has. So this is a kind of uh, intuition that you can try to understand. Now, if you try to compare between single instruction and SISG and SIMD, so SISG take one instruction and then one data element and then actually perform the uh, computation with the result. But in SIMD, you have only one instruction, but there are several processing cores, and each of the processing cores performs computation on its own different data, uh, on its data elements, and then perform the computation and then uh, it gives you the result. And you may be asking uh, where can I see this kind of SIMD architecture? So the real life example is uh, GPUs. So graphics processing is that one of the examples of this SIMD architecture. Now the fourth kind of classification is uh, the other classification is uh, MIMD. This is actually multiple instructions and multiple data. So here you have multiple processing units. You can see that uh, this is PU or the processing units. You have instructions. Instructions can be from instruction pool, and you also have data um, that is put in that is uh, the, the, the data is inside in the data pool. Now each processing core can perform an independent instruction, can take an independent instruction, and can take any independent data, any, any different data, and then try to execute. So basically, processing core uh, one uh, if it is performing addition. The different processing core can perform the multiplication or it could be division or it could be any other operation. So it is not necessary that you perform the same operation. And the data also need not be same. If suppose processing core 1 is performing the operation on A and B, the other processing core could be processing on C and D, etc. So it need not be the same. So this is why it says multiple instruction, multiple data. So different processing core can execute different instruction on different data. And you will be asking well, where, where are these kind of architectures are being seen. So these are seen in typically in multi-process, multi-process and SMT, shared only multi-processors and clusters, new machines, etc. So these are all there in the real time. So uh, this is just to give an overview about different uh, uh, classification, but let us now try to go a little bit more details into uh, the first class. This is, uh, we'll talk about this class is actually MIMP. So MIMT, uh, they are classified into two more categories that is called as a shared memory multiprocessor and then a message passing multiprocessor. So in the shared memory multiprocessor, now you have set of processing cores and then you have a main memory. And the main memory is actually uh, shared uh, globally, uh, shared, uh, shared across all the processing units. So there is a notion of shared global memory access. So all the processors see basically the same memory and the memory is shared among all the processes. Now if the processor, two processors needs to communicate each other, then they can communicate it using the synchronization cluster. And this kind of architectures uh, are traditionally called as symmetric multiprocessing because uh, several multiprocessors basically see the same memory, uh, same memory, uh, same, see the same latency for the memory, so that's called a symmetric multiprocessor. Now, uh, the programming model is similar to uniprocessing model except that operation shard shared data requires synchronization. So, each processor basically can perform independent tasks, but if you need to communicate, then you require explicit synchronization concept. And the programming language also provides the explicit synchronization concept. So, the shared memory architecture that you see in the picture is actually uh, the, some of the architecture that you see in the real life. But uh, this kind of architecture come into the uh, life after several decades of research. So let's just uh, give some of the, uh, let's, let's give an overview of the different shared memory multiprocessors actually has evolved uh, over the several years. So again, shared memory multiprocessors are nothing but uh, they share a single global memory address space. So the initial design of shared memory multiprocessors uh, started with a transport switch. 
where you have uh, you have a switch. Uh, one side you have memory elements that are connected, and the other side you have processing and I/O core elements that are processing. So each processor uh, basically catches the memory in a uniform memory associated state, and this is actually the Smith multiprocessor. And now the memory is shared across all these processors. You can see that any processor can actually see the same memory, and all the processors see the same memory. Now the problem with this was that uh, increasing the number of processors actually lead to additional loss, uh, cost in the network latency, and increasing the transfer speed, etc. So people uh, find this to be uh, that practical in nature when you have scale it. So people have started exploring. This is called as a multi-stage interconnection. So here people started using uh, the switches or routers in between, uh, where on the one side you have Processing cores and I/O elements, and then you have multi-core systems. No, multi-core. Sorry, you, know, you have memory. Now each processor can see, uh, see the access the uh, memory, and the memory is shared across all the processing core elements. And uh, they are accessed basically. Uh, the, the memory is accessed by processing uh, by routing through that basically. Now uh, again, this solution has not found to be uh, that scalable. Uh, the switch latency has been increasing when you increase the number of processors, etc. So the the latency to access memory location. So people have again after several decades of research, people have started using the bus based internet. So here with the bus based internet, you have again processing cores and the cache is on one side, and then you have memory elements on the one side, and each processor basically the the memory is shared across all the processing cores. Now uh, they are connected using something called as a bus based internet to give the better bandwidth and better latency. So over the several years, so people have started with uh, transfer switch and then then multi-stage interconnection networks and then finally they landed with uh, bus based interconnection network for connecting with process and uh, memory units. So so you have uh, processing cores on one side of the elements. Uh, these are the type of architecture that you see in the real life, and you have the memory units, and the memory is basically shared across all the processing units, and then you have I/O devices interconnected. And all the the main thing is that all the processes basically see uh, shared memory global architecture. Now uh, the thing is that uh, now when when you have to actually when uh, the, the kind of architectures, uh, the SFT architectures, uh, classified into, uh, really classified into the, the, the bus based interconnect again is classified into two categories, that is unified memory access category, in which uh, all the processes basically uh, are connected to one side of the interconnect and you have main memory uh, that's connected, that is they are connected using some interconnection network. So all the processes are actually have the same uncontrolled latency to memory. So regardless of uh, where actually the memory is, whether it's local to it or it's far away or it's uh, nearby, regardless of it, all the processes are actually uh, seeing the same memory access latency. And the interconnection, interconnection network has been maintained so that uh, the access latency for each of the processor actually has been the same. And this is actually uh, the kind of classification of shared memory multiprocessor where you have uniform memory access, which means that uh, each processor is actually in the same latency for accessing the memory. And uh, this, can, this is one of the architectures uh, that you can see. This is the Intel uh, Pentium 4 Pro uh, processor quad pack. Uh, this is one of the processor architectures, shared memory multi processor architecture. And this is a uniform shared memory multi, uniform memory access architecture. Where you have processing cores, uh, this is actually the P4 uh, module. Uh, these are the processing cores. Um, they are there one side and the other side you have the memory controller and MIU and then you have DRAM. So all of them are actually uh, seeing the shared memory address space and uh, they, also, they also have the same memory access latency. And the bus based interconnect is ensured that all the memory, uh, all the processor mod modules basically see the same uh, access latency for accessing the main memory. So this is one type of uh, shared memory architectures uh, for uniform memory architectures. So this is one of the real time example. And the other example is basically in the context of uh, some uh, enterprise servers, where you have uh, uh, you have a bus which are connected. Uh, to the bus, you have several cars. 
and the cards can be uh, either type. So the cards are typically here 16 types, and uh, so you have 16 cards, and the cards can be either two types, uh, either processor plus memory or IO. I would, uh, I would. So either you can have a processor or memory together, or you can and you could have I would. So you can see that here uh, on the top of this particular bus, you can see you have processing ports as well as your bus interconnect. On the on the below, you can see that there are I would. And uh, these parts can be 16. Uh, the, the number of parts can be 16. And uh, here, even though the processors as well as memory are uh, packed into one card, the connection is ensured that uh, each processor sees the same memory acceptation. So, so it is actually semantic multiprocessor. So again, it is a uniform memory acceptation. Yes. So, frequency yes. uh, so is so low, 83 megahertz. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. So why the frequency is so low, 83 megahertz? Yeah, these are the early days actually. Is it clear? Uh, sorry, I could not get you. Okay, so these are the early designs of the architecture. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. So this is one of the, I mean, I am trying to explain different kinds of architectures and some evolution about it. So, okay. uh, frequencies and all, they have evolved over the years. Okay, so this is one of the architecture that you have seen. This is a, a shared memory multiprocessor architecture where you have unified memory access pattern, uh, where all the processor are seeing the same memory access latency for the when you are trying to access the memory. So uh, the unified memory access uh, is basically uh, has one advantage, that is that uh, the data placement is actually uh, unimportant. So when you are writing the program, uh, when the uh, when you're when you're allocating the uh, data the data could be anywhere in the memory and the, all the processes are being since they are seeing the same memory uh, access latency depending on where it is actually located whether it's located to the processor one or processor two it doesn't really matter so they are seeing the same memory access latency so that is why it is easier to optimize the code and make use of the available mem memory space so you don't programmer doesn't have to worry where the data is actually uh, placed when the memory is allocated so, but the problem on the, the, with the unified memory access latency is that, uniform memory access is that, scaling the system uh, has actually increases all the latency. So, suppose you have to add more and more processors into the system, then the network interconnection networks has to be increased in a such a way that it uh, actually it, uh, causes long latency. The latency when you scale the processors has actually has been increasing over the 70 years. And the contention could also restrict the band bandwidth and increase latency. So this is one of the side uh, downside of the unified memory access. Uh, unified memory access. So when you are trying to increase it, the number of when you are trying to scale the number of processes, so the latency also has been increasing. Um, if you, in order to maintain the same memory access latency, uh, same memory access latency. So in general, so people have uh, for scaling shared memory architecture, so people have tried two things. So one is Unified memory access by using the bus based interconnect. And, but this the problem is that they are uh, also having the problems with the increase in latency when the number of processors are actually increasing. So the other approach is basically called as uh, non uniform uh, memory access latency. Uh, the, any, these are called NUMA architectures. So here the, uh, the, the main idea is that so the processors and uh, the, you have one side you have processors and you also have. Uh, memory units, which are the other side of the interconnect, and uh, the processors which are actually uh, having the memory, which is local to it, which is nearby, actually have high memory latency. Uh, sorry, it's a low memory latency, like this. so it takes uh, you can access it very fast compared to the uh, memory which is located far away. So this is actually uh, one of the other type of architecture, and this has become more scalable. Uh, but the problem uh, with this new architecture is that now the placement of the data depends on the uh, where the, the performance of the application depends on where the, actually the data is located. So this is one of the different kind. This is uh, one of the uh, disadvantages of it. So uh, so you can see that you have uh, interconnect. You have a processor as well as memory. So all the processors basically have a global uh, shared memory access. 
but the problem is that uh, the processor which has uh, memory which is local to it which is nearby it can access it fast compared to the memory that is uh, very far away so low latency one advantage is to the local memory and uh, the now side is much higher latency to remote memory so if suppose there is a processor one which is needs to access the memory which is far away then it has to go through uh, long latency cycles to access that particular memory and the bandwidth to local may be higher because it's nearby and the performance is very sensitive to data base. so this is the disadvantage so the performance of your application depends on actually depends on the way the data is actually located so if you have to get better performance you have to uh, consider the case where the data is less very in here uh, local to the processing element that is that is trying to perform the operations so let's try to understand some of the examples of uh, the numa machines how uh, they actually have uh, been presented so one of the machine is actually called uh, cm5 this is the connection uh, machine 5 so here you can see that uh, you have a black box where you have uh, pns pns in the processing nodes each processing node has a processor as well as some uh, memory elements and then you have uh, they are connected using some uh, interconnect and then you also have io devices etc so you are seeing the uh, you are also seeing the processor architecture over here and uh, the processor which is near to it basically the uh, the memory uh, which is near to the processor can be accessed fast and if it is uh, far away then it, it has to be accessed uh, it takes long, long memory latency and uh, this is one of the actually uh, the data architectures uh, where the connection architecture so this is for the same thing where it shows the data and control network so this has been expanded over here you can see that on the on the bottom side on the leaf nodes you have the processor and io nodes and uh, this is basically there the processors are actually connected using the interconnect so this is a tree based interconnect they are using uh, in those connection machines now suppose if they have to if one processor basically needs to access a memory located uh, it's actually nearby then it doesn't require much latency but suppose if you actually uh, need to if a processor needs to access a memory which is located at somewhat far away then it has to go to multiple switches and if you in the high, high amount of latency and if you have to increase the number of processors again you have to increase the tree, tree topology accordingly accordingly the, the latency also is going to increase so to summarize so if you are accessing a data uh, which is near to it, the processing course is uh, much lower latency, otherwise it is a higher latency. So do you have any uh, questions uh, so far? Okay, so I'll uh, wait for about half a minute or so. Sir, I have a small confusion. So, uh, mm -hmm. when you have non-uniform cache access, is it like um, which cache is exactly like uh, separate, like L3 cache or? No, no. In the uh, nowadays, you have L1 is a private, L1 and L2, and L3 is the common architecture, common shared memory, shared access cache. So, if suppose a processor is accessing a cache L1, which is private, then you see uh, much higher latency, much lower latency. And if you are accessing a, a cache which is located uh, on a chip of uh, near which is another processor then you see a higher latency oh yes sir okay, okay. now so far now we have seen one class of uh, mimd architectures where uh, you have seen shared memory uh, processor architectures where so the processors see the same shared memory address space. Uh, now, within that, you have seen UMA, that is non-unified. Non UMA is basically unified memory access architecture. And we have also seen non-unified memory access architecture. And then we have seen some of the examples um, that were there or that has actually evolved, etc. Now, this is another kind of uh, architecture that is called as a message passing architecture. Now, uh, this is a kind of architecture uh, you see where there is no sh concept of shared global memory address space. So you can see an example over here. So you have a set of compute nodes. Uh, the, each compute node consists of processes and cache. And it also has a memory. 
and I will. Basically, each of them is actually like an independent machine, and uh, several machines are actually connected using some interconnect. So, it depends on the inter data type of interconnect and the uh, bandwidth, etc., is provided. So, now there is no concept of globally shared memory address space. So, each processor has its own dedicated memory, and uh, there is no, uh, the, the memory of one processor is not shared with another processor. Very rare. So this is basically uh, you can be visualized as a multiple computer networks, uh, basically network based multiple process. Now you may be saying that suppose there is a data that is uh, placed in uh, one processor, let's say processor B1, and you need to access the data from the another processors. Now the way if you the way the, way the synchronization is works or the communication is works is by using the explicit send and receive system. So in the message passing architecture, there is no concept of global shared memory and all the synchronous communication will happen only through the send and receive uh, components, basically. So let's say that you have one machine and you have a processor, uh, you have a processor and there is a process P on one side and there is a process Q on the other side on which a different machine. Now let's say you have to uh, transfer the data from uh, one process to another process uh, which are located in let's say different machine. Then you, uh, this particular process P basically sends a uh, message called send message, and the other process basically uh, issues a receive command, say that you receive the command, you receive the data. So this is how the, the synchronization will work, or the communication will work. But in case of shared memory architectures, so any processor can see any memory directly. You don't need an explicit send and receive command, you can use the load and store instruction. But if you want to ensure the order, you can use the synchronization constructs, etc. But here the communication only happens through the send and receive command. Uh, so it basically the service needs to send the data, it should send and then other one will receive the data. So these are the things that are actually happened in the, uh, these are things that occur in the message passing architecture. Now you may be seeing where actually this kind of architectures are seen. So this is one of the early designs of the uh, message passing architectures where you have uh, eight compute nodes. Uh, each compute node has its own processing cores as well as I.O. as well as memory limits. And these processors are basically connected using some uh, 3D interconnect. And you also have uh, each connect for each pair of processor, you see that you have some different queues, uh, send queue as well as written uh, receive queues. Uh, that helps you to communicate the data between uh, these two processors. And they are connected using in the form of the 3D networks. But the problem is that uh, this has uh, resulted into a lot of network complexities when you have to increase the number of processes. So it was not that feasible. So people have started uh, different types of architectures, uh, better inter interconnect so that you can have a uh, good latency as well as uh, bandwidth. Uh, this is another example of uh, MIMD message passing architectures. So basically you can see that you have a crack bar switch here. Uh, in the crash bar switch, uh, you can see that there are several compute nodes. They are connected uh, each other using some uh, switch. Each basically machine has uh, dedicated processing cores and then as well as RAM and then I/O units. And you can see that there is a uh, interconnect to connect these two machines in an effective manner. So, and this basically each of this uh, machine is actually compute unit is R RS6000 workstation and their network uh, interface integrated on an I.O. bus. But the bandwidth is limited by the I.O. bus interface. So this is an example of message passing architecture, IBM SC2, that has uh, come into the pictures over the, the before several years. Now, uh, this is uh, another architecture. Uh, this is again the message passing architecture. Uh, here, uh, each of the compute node, uh, you can see it is a rectangle box. Yes, on the white color, small rectangle box. And this, each of these boxes again uh, is a shared memory multiprocessor. So you have uh, multiple processors, multiple machines which are connected using the message passing architecture. There is no shared memory across all the processing nodes across all the processor. But within a particular compute node, uh, here there are uh, the, uh, you have a shared memory processor architecture. So this kind of architecture you can see in the real life uh, clusters or supercomputers, etc. So each machine could be itself is a shared memory architecture, shared memory architecture. But the different machines could be connected using the 
different interconnect message passing architectures. So this is uh, one example of uh, Intel Paragon message passing architectures. So just to see some of uh, evolutions how uh, different architectures have evolved. So the early designs of uh, 19, early designs in 1960s. So people started with a crossbar architectures uh, where you have a, you have a crossbar where you have one side you have processors and the other side you have memory units. Uh, they are connected. Uh, the, the early designs were unified memory access pattern, unified memory access architectures, and this is a shared memory class uh, architectures. And these are there in the 1960s and 70s, but this has become a problem because of the uh, when you try to scale it. So people uh, have started using 1980s burst based interconnect uh, after resolving the several latency issues and bandwidth issues. So you have uh, processors as well as memory, they are connected using some high bandwidth interconnect. And these are uh, there in 1980s and uh, the historical evolutions were in the late 1980s and mid 90s. You have now several multiple uh, uh, computing nodes. You can see that each SMP is basically, uh, it could be shared memory, each machine could be a shared memory or not a shared memory multiprocessors. And these machines are connected using some form of the interconnect. And uh, there is no concept of uh, um, dedicated shared memory. Uh, that there is no sh shared memory. So the actual memory is distributed across all the memories. And the, the way of communication happens through the send and receive, basically. And uh, there is also non-uniform memory access latency. Suppose one processor needs to access the memory, which is in one machine. And it could be, uh, but uh, if it is on a different machine, then you need to go to the interconnect to access the latency. So you can see the different uh, non uniform memory access pattern, uh, access latency. If you are accessing uh, uh, from the same uh, local memory, you are going to see it fast, otherwise, it's going to be very slow. So, this is how the uh, different kinds of uh, architectures have evolved. So, in the MIMD itself, so this is actually multiple instructions and multiple data. Two classifications, unified memory access latency, uh, UMA architectures, and uh, first, uh, shared memory multiple access architectures. There you have UMA and non uh, uh, NUMA, UMA architectures. And then you also have uh, message passing architectures, where uh, there is no concept of dedicated shared memory, and the message, only the communication happens to the same receive. But internally, how the communication happens uh, depends on the hardware primitives that are provided. If suppose, uh, if the network directly access allows you to access the direct memory access, then you can use the DMA to transfer the data. If it doesn't allow, then you have to use explicit uh, send and receive uh, programming constraints, etc. So, are there any questions uh, till this point of time? I would like to take a pause here. Uh, suppose we have uh, accelerator, can they be shared in all the systems? In all the system means uh, different machines, you are saying? Sir, mm -hmm. sir like uh, accelerator, like suppose we have this a single accelerator. Mm -hmm. um, like, can it be uh, used like without affecting um, any other system? Like, can it be, uh, can the same uh, single accelerator be used in any type of the uh, systems? No, no, actually in the accelerator itself, you have several processing cores and all the processing cores see the same memory, same global memory. Basically, if you think about GPU, they use the same global memory. So it's actually like a shared memory multiprocessor. And it is also possible that you can put several uh, GPUs or uh, basically accelerators on different uh, machines, but they will become a non-uniform memory. Uh, okay, sir. The, the, okay. Um, I can pass first uh, about half minute more to see if there are any other questions. Okay, I think uh, we are going to go ahead. So now, so yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, sorry, sir. Um, so, can I just uh, tell exactly where GPU will be like placed, like in the um, 
message passing architecture like no it is in simd it's basically it's an simd architecture but in mimd also it is possible for you to place gpu so where you uh, where each compute node you can have one or more gpus each compute node. i can't have a single gpu for all of them ha huh, that may be the question of research sorry sir can you repeat that is the question of research Okay. Whether it is possible to have, but uh, so far we have seen in the in the clusters or anything is that each machine has a dedicated one or multi one or more GPUs, and they are connected using a high bandwidth interconnect. So maybe you can use um, and suppose it's in the context of NVIDIA, they also use NVIDIA direct uh, GPU direct technology also where you can access the data in a remote memory location using the high bandwidth interconnect. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we can continue now. So now we have seen so far this MIMD architectures. Also, SISD, uh, SISD, SDSD has been covered in detail, so we don't have to go into any of the details more. So now I will talk about SIMD architectures, so which are basically single instruction multiple data architectures. So just to recap, uh, the difference between SISD and MISD. In SISD, you have one single instruction is uh, taken by one processing core, and then it takes the data elements corresponding to it, and it executes the result, and perform the computation, and then execute the use the result. And in case of SIMD, uh, you have set of processing cores. That take the same instruction. Now, let's say the one processing code performing addition, all the remaining processing codes also perform the same operation, same addition operation. But they can be doing the uh, processing of operations on a different data element. So it's possible that if let's say there are three processing codes and uh, three uh, processing codes perform the same addition, but they can perform the addition on different data elements. So this is a, this is how the SMD architectures uh, will uh, will actually do the perform uh, perform the computations. Uh, now uh, when tries to come about how to write program basically on the on this kind of uh, SMD architectures, basically people started using the data panel programming model. So where the uh, the what it basically says that operations are performed on each uh, element of large reg uh, regular data structure. So for example. Uh, let's say you have two vectors B and C, and you want to do the A and B, and you want to do the multiplication to uh, get the final element C. Then you don't have to write a for loop saying that uh, C i is equal to B i, A and A i into B i for all for i equal to one to n. You don't need to write, but simply you can provide the programming constructs, maybe saying that C is equal to A into B. So internally it translates to uh, saying that uh, you do the perform multiplication across each and every uh, data corresponding data elements. And the programming model may support it. Now, internally, if the architecture supports uh, the single instruction multiple data execution model or not, either they could be executed in sequential or parallel. Uh, now, suppose on a sequential hardware, suppose uh, if the same operation C is equal to A to B is given, and uh, if there is the if you do not have the same the architecture, so internally they could be translated into uh, um, addition, so multiplication, where you each thread basically performing, so where you have multiplication performed by A0 and B0, uh, and then you have after that A1 and B1 is performed multiplication, and so on and so forth. Since you have only multi one processing course, uh, you can see that you require 32 units of uh, operation, 32 units of cycles to perform these computations for the same operation C is equal to A into B. Now, if you have the parallel uh, SMD architectures where you have the data parallel hardware, now the same operations can be performed in one site, one unit of cycle instead. Because the same operation could be given to the set of processing cores. Now, the operation is being basically the multiplication operation. Each processing course is basically performing the multiplication on different data. So, the first processing core is basically perform the multiplication on A0 and B0. The second one is uh, performing multiplication on A1 and B1, and it does the multiplication and gives you the result. Now, in case of SIMD architecture, uh, the operation has to be same. The operation here is the multiplication, but the data elements are actually different here. 
so this is how actually the assembly uh, the architecture can, uh, the assembly execution can take place so the operation is same the operation is same but the data elements are uh, different now you may be saying that uh, where can I actually um, uh, what kind of applications basically use these particular operations so the real life example is like image processing applications where you can, you can see in gaming or videos etc where you may be interested in performing the same operation across multiple uh, pixels that are being made image. so maybe changing the color or maybe uh, changing the contrast etc so there are different types of operations that you could perform on the same uh, uh, on same operation could be performed on a different pixel level. so this is where actually people have started using and uh, graph uh, data parallel uh, applications like one is a graph identical application where you need to perform same operations on several compute nodes. That also people have started using. So the early data parallel architectures, actually the design of early parallel architecture mirrored the programming model that we just simply talked about. And the single control, so you have a single controller processor basically broadcast each instruction to an array of uh, or grid of processing core elements. You have a set of processing cores that they need to process the same, uh, basically, they need to execute the same instruction. So there is a processor control, controller which issues the instruction, and then the same instruction is executed by different processing cores. And then many processing elements can be controlled by the master. Uh, the early design of this particular kind of architecture is actually connection machine. And uh, then the later on, you have massive parallel processors and accelerators like GPU. So let us try to understand uh, the early design that is actually called as a connection machine. So this is an example of a SAMD architecture, data parallel processing architectures. On one side, uh, you can see on the right hand side, you can see uh, a front end, which basically uh, is responsible for providing all the input output operations or uh, IO devices, etc. And there is also a bus interface that is basically, and you also have Processing cores. Uh, these processing cores are uh, basically uh, they are divided into four boxes. You can see each of them. Each of the box is actually having 16,384 uh, processes on each of these. So you have four connection machines inside this. So basically four boxes, and they are connected using the front end using some Nexus cross port switch. And these are basically uh, the front end is basically supplies the instructions to these processing cores, and they try to execute it and they are connected to the sequencer. Now, all the processing cores, 16,384 processors in a connection machine execute the same operations on different data. So this is an early design of the connection uh, data processor architectures, where some same operation is given for multiple uh, processing cores, and then they do the same uh, operation, and but they aren't different. They operate on a different data. So these are the early designs, but uh, the evolution has happened and uh, people have started having uh, better designs for uh, SAMD architectures. So these uh, people have started coming on SAMD units on a chip along with other caches also. Now people have uh, located uh, SAMD exhibition units as well as uh, caches and the private caches along with this. And it has become more gender over the several years where you have multiple co cooperating uh, multiple processors. So you have certain streaming multiprocessors that are connected using some interconnect. And this is an example of uh, GPUs. And uh, these kind of architectures have provided special uh, hardware support also for synchronization, explicit synchronization, and global synchronization, et cetera. So these kind of architectures have started providing. So today, uh, the, for the rest of the talk, we'll talk about uh, the GPUs in a very brief manner, the graphics processing units. Uh, this is one of the architecture for SI, and this is a, one of the SMD architecture. And let's see how actually it has evolved over the several years. So SIMD, uh, so graphics processing units basically exhibit SIMD architectures. The early design of uh, GPUs were meant for graphics processing only because and the graphics application required to uh, perform the same operation on multiple data elements. So same operation has to be performed. So this has uh, motivated the need for SMD architecture. And the early designs of uh, GPUs were less programmable. But after several years, uh, like for example, in 2007, the fully programmable GPUs have come into pictures. And uh, NVIDIA has also released uh, 
programming language, programming framework called CUDA that allows the uh, users to write general purpose computations on uh, exploiting the GPU. So just to uh, slightly uh, appreciate how GPUs are actually uh, different from CPUs in terms of the execution units, etc., architecture. So if you have a single core processor, you have one processing cores and M1 cache and M2 cache, then you have DRAM. So this we have studied in the previous architectures. In case of multiple CPUs, you have multiple processing cores, and each processing core is associated with the M1 cache. And you could, you could also have L2 cache. Uh, sometimes the L2 cache will also be private, and instead of that, you could have L3 cache over here. In the, the, in the multi-core architecture, you have typically the fewer number of uh, processing cores. But uh, if you have to understand the different kinds of uh, the, the differences now in terms of architectures, here uh, GPUs have thousands of processing cores. So the recently has launched 800 GPU. This has uh, shown to be one of the, uh, the best performing architectures, NVIDIA GPU architecture. And they, these processing cores are basically divided into what is called as the streaming multiprocessor. And each streaming multiprocessor has L1 cache. This is private to each streaming multiprocessor. And then you also have L2 cache in global memory, which can be accessed by any of the processing cores. And this processing set of processing cores basically perform uh, the SIMD execution execution. Basically, same instruction they execute based on different data. So this is how it looked like. And uh, this is one of the SIMD architecture for NVIDIA GPU, V100 GPUs. Uh, you can see this is the architecture of the SIM, uh, NVIDIA GPU, where you see the small yellow rectangle box. This is basically a streaming multiprocessor. So this is like one of the box. Okay, you can see that there are so many streaming multiprocessors, and you also have uh, uh, this this um, this 300 GPUs can be connected to another 300 GPU using some inbuilt inter inter -current. And then you also have L2 cache and the global memory that could be L2 cache, which is, which is the common L2 cache, and also it could be connected to the GP mem GP memory, that's the GPU DRAM. Let's see how actually uh, different uh, GPU architectures have also evolved. So the early uh, so uh, some of the uh, um, good designs of GPUs are K40 and then M40, which actually M is the Maxwell architecture, and B is the Pascal architecture, and then V is the Volta architecture. So Tesla K40, Tesla M40, and Tesla B100, and Tesla V100. So uh, this basically table shows how the number of streaming multiprocessors have been evolving across the several GPUs. So initially, uh, for K40, it has uh, 15 SMs, basically streaming multiprocessors. And then uh, to increase the performance, etc. so the, in the Maxwell architecture, 24 uh, streaming multiprocessors have come into picture. And then P100 architecture, you have 56 SMs. And then in V100, you have 80 SM. So basically, this is an architecture of V100 GPU, where each of them is actually a streaming multiprocessor. Within each streaming multiprocessor, you have several uh, uh, hundreds of processing cores. They execute on an SIMD execution plan. And this slide basically also shows the, how the, the computations, the uh, FP32 cores as well as FP64 cores are also, the compute units are also increasing per GPU. So if you see uh, the bandwidth and the, and the big uh, flow, the giga floating point operation for seconds that is actually being uh, evolved over the several years for the GPUs. Uh, so this basically slide shows the comparison from CPU to GPU. You can see that uh, the gigabit, uh, the, the memory bandwidth, peak memory bandwidth achieved by GPUs have been uh, increasing um, rapidly. Uh, compared to the CPU uh, CPU bandwidth, and also the, the in terms of the performance, also CPU GPUs have started doing much better compared to the CPUs. This is because uh, GPUs can exploit um, thousands of processing cores uh, by exploiting the um, by, and you can execute uh, you, you can use this processing core to achieve the, uh, to achieve a lot of computation. That's why you can see that good uh, floating point operations is also achieved. So it depends on the application as well. Suppose if your application is exhibiting data parallel behavior, then you could use GPUs to improve the performance of the application. So now because GPUs have become, uh, GPUs have provided several compute capabilities. So people have started using in various kinds of domains, not just uh, the graphics applications like media entertainment that has happened before. 
Now people are using across various domains like climate modeling, security, uh, the computational fluid dynamics like mechanical engineering, or people have started using nowadays very actively in deep learning and machine learning. So this has become inevitable for them. And also in supercomputer as well as education and research that is used, uh, the GPUs are used uh, over there also. And like medical imaging and the computational finance, these are some of the domains where people are using it, but it is being like adopted in various kinds of domains. Wherever you need data parallel architectures, where you need a lot of computations you need to perform, where there is exhibit some uh, parallelism, then people have started using this particular architecture, GPUs. And uh, the one problem uh, that the GPUs are actually facing is that uh, the um, memory issues. So this is again the same slide, the, the specification slide for the GPUs, but here, um, uh, here actually we are showing the memory size. So if you see that K40, uh, M40, and P100 and V100 GPUs, so they have very limited uh, memory sizes. You can see that K40 has 12 GB memory, M40 has up to 24 GB, P100 architecture has 16 GB, V100 architecture has 16, uh, 16 GB. Even the recent architecture, that is the A Tesla, uh, so this is A100 architecture, has up to 80 GB. But uh, the real world applications are actually need to process large amounts of data. It can go up to uh, uh, hundreds, thousands of gigabytes of data, so real world applications. So people are still uh, actually thinking about how to improve the architecture, how to come up with a better architecture so that you can address the memory limitations. So uh, one kind of uh, recent direction that started is towards a multi-GPU system where we have set of multiple GPUs located on single machine. And there, these multiple uh, GPUs are actually uh, connected using some, uh, is basically connected using the high bandwidth interconnect, like NVLink is one of the interconnect. So again, this is like, uh, in a single machine, you have multiple GPUs, they are connected using a different machine. So this is an architecture of uh, DGX1 uh, that has actually come in. Now we have DGX2, and then people are trying to integrate even for the and GPUs as well. So they have uh, several uh, GPUs. These green boxes are actually GPUs. You have eight GPUs. And uh, the GPUs themselves are connected using a high bandwidth interconnect called NVT. And if you need to access the, the memory of CPUs, then you can connect it using the PCI Express switch buses, etc. And if you suppose if you have, uh, let's say you have two machines. In each machine, let's say you have eight GPUs. And you can also connect from one machine to another machine by saying that uh, you can connect it using the PIC switch and the network interface card. On the other hand, you also have, can have an IC and then you can access the uh, PCI Express and then access the GPU. So, on. so, so this is the architecture of multi GPU systems in a single GPU. These are evolved uh, to address the memory limitations uh, of GPUs. Now, people have started for distributed multi GPU systems where you can have different compute nodes in each compute node you can have multiple gpus also so these are the typical kinds of nodes are visible in the real life supercomputers and clusters so one of the top supercomputers also has this kind of distributed multi gpu platform so just to uh, summarize um, parallel architectures have become inevitable this is because the number of we kept on increasing the number of processors number of transistors on a chip the processors are actually having the heat dissipation and power constraints. So uh, this has led to the evolution of uh, splitting the processing cores into multiple parallel processing cores. Uh, now, depending on how you place the data elements or how you place the processing cores and the memory, so people have started uh, various research and different kinds of architectures have evolved over the several years. And uh, Flynn has come up with a uh, Flynn has come up with a, a taxonomy for different architectures how they have evolved, and he classified into uh, SISD single instruction single data, and then multiple instruction single data. This is not actually very practical, and you have multiple instruction multiple data. These are also very practical, and you can see it in the real life real life as well. And then SIMD also single instruction multiple data. These are the kind of GPUs are one of the examples. So uh, the historical evolution, if you see the current status, so we have chip multiprocessors, we have multiple uh, multi cores like uh, SMPs, uh, shared memory multiprocessors we have, uh, you have unified memory architectures, nowadays you, have, you also see non-unified memory architectures, 
where each uh, shared memory architecture could consist of processor, cache, and memory. So you also have on uh, the single desktops or um, the laptops, etc. And you also have uh, clusters and data centers where you have um, uh, several machines which are connected using some form of interconnect, and the interconnect could be high bandwidth interconnect. So most of the uh, evolutions are actually driven by the economics and cost, basically to address the power, latency, and also the space constraints, etc. So if you have, uh, um, uh, if you require architecture require too much space, then uh, then you need a better better solution for it. And architectures are also driven by the applications. For example, you see uh, nowadays you have architectures people are trying for. Uh, machine learning workload. So they exhibit different kinds of memory access pattern and uh, execution scheme. So people are trying to come up with the application specific uh, architectures to improve the performance. So people are, the architectures are also evolving to suit the application requirement also. GPUs are one of the examples also. They were actually demanding the same operation on multiple data elements. So people have started using it. So, um, uh, so depends on the application, so the architectures are also evolved uh, depending on the type of applications. Also. So how the architectures of the future, uh, it will look like actually, uh, it is possible that you can have, it may be, we, we don't know, it's a question of research, so it's possible that in the future we could have cluster or data center, data center kind of floating point operation, it was still possible to have a single chip, or you could also have multi-heterogeneous architectures, or you could also have uh, application specific hardware architectures. So depending on the application type, uh, up, depending on the application, you could also come up with a different kind of architectures. So these are some of the differences for my today's slides. Um, I'll also upload the slides on the Microsoft Teams platform. And uh, that's all I have for today. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to get them. Okay, so I see one question, sir. Do we pay attention to the issues because it's multi CPU system? Yes, so if you have to access uh, data, which is in, uh, suppose let's say that you have two GPUs which are located on different machines, then if one GPU is trying to access the memory which is located on the other machine, then you will have a latency issue when you have to access it. That's true. Okay, any other questions or concerns? So this week, I, this, this lecture, I did not want to go into detail of any particular architectures. I wanted to give an overview about how the parallel architectures have evolved and uh, what are the different kinds of parallel architectures are there. Now in the rest of today's week, uh, so, so today's sessions, also as the next week's sessions, we'll have some more details about how the, uh, what are the different technologies or techniques or architectures are used in each of these categories. So the next uh, basically session next week is going to be more and more details about it. Uh, excuse me, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, so then uh, if GPUs are much better than CPUs, then uh, why aren't uh, GPUs default? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually that's a good question. So GPUs are very powerful, but uh, they exhibit only the SIMD execution pattern where you have a single instruction, multiple data. Where you suppose your application exhibits uh, where you need to prof perform the same computation on multiple data elements, then SIMDs are very useful. But if, say, let's say if you have uh, need to up run applications which do not exhibit this pattern, where you have, uh, where basically different processing code, if you need to perform some different data access pattern, then uh, the SIMD execution units are not efficient in doing that. And then you will incur high amount of, you can incur high over it compared to the CPU execution. So it is also possible that you need, so it is, uh, it is not that GPUs are alone sufficient, CPUs are often required when you need to perform heterogeneous computing. So that is where people have started, uh, even the heterogeneous architecture where you have CPUs and GPUs, depending on the application uh, that you exhibit. So if suppose your application at runtime, if it is using the SMD execution pattern, then you transfer the workload to GPU. And if suppose if your application at some time you found that it is not exhibiting SIMD execution pattern, then you shift it to the CPUs. 
So depending on the application behavior. So the research is also uh, started towards uh, how to improve the performance of application for this heterogeneous architecture. Uh, is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So again, I said this is just to, to give an overview and not to go into any detail. So again, I'll uh, in the next week I will have a session on GPUs. So I'll talk about uh, the brief introduction to GPUs and uh, how to write programs on the GPUs also. And I will also have a lab session for, this, uh, for GPU computation. And uh, on the, the next week, the first day will be on the multi-core CPUs, where uh, different types of techniques like. Uh, how the cache coherence occurs and uh, um, this uh, the, the, the memory consistency issues and how the different kinds of uh, what different processing uh, how the processing takes place across the shared memory material processor architectures so things so on and so forth that will be discussed in very detail in the in the next week so please pay attention to the next week session these are going to be some advanced topics so 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 far we have covered what we have covered in the till the last day was the the basic concept, basic concepts in computer architectures, and this today's lecture, today's sessions are basically tries to give you a transition to the next week uh, topics. Uh, excuse me, sir. Another question. Uh, can you have very GPUs for embedded system? Very small uh, GPUs. Uh, a tailored for embedded systems so or very small. No, no, your, uh, your voice was breaking in between. I could not hear it. Okay. Uh, so I'm asking, like, uh, can we have uh, very small GPUs? I mean, uh, tailored for specific needs for embedded systems. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, definitely, it is possible. Uh, in the so, so people have started using it also. Like, example, if in the, in the mobiles also, <laughs> you could have GPUs also. So tailored for uh, your specific requirement. So depending on the application. So nowadays you have IoT devices, right? So these devices are coming into pictures. They are sensing the elements and they are locally processing it. So if the data amount of data volume is high, then you could also place uh, smaller mm -hmm. CPUs onto that. So it is still possible. So the research is still evolving, and the research directions are like driven by the application requirements also, where for better producing better parallel architectures, and also depends on the other cost and performance and other constraints also. Energy has again become a major concern, leakage energy. So people are trying in multiple various research directions so that to address uh, all these constraints. So the computer architecture field has been evolving again. Uh, it has a lot of opportunities. OK, so there is one more question. Will we be using GPGPU SIM next week lab? Uh, it is installed, but so I uh, will be uh, the GPU lab will be focusing on uh, not GPGPU SIM because it requires some effort. Uh, so maybe we'll be focusing on uh, uh, CUDA programming, how to write programs on GPUs. So don't worry about it. I'll give the necessary instructions. The lab will be conducted by me and I'll give the necessary instructions. Okay, then uh, I think if there are no more questions, we can hang up. Uh, shall I share my screen? Uh, hello, is it Preeti? Yes. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So please you can start. Uh, uh, just a second. Can I stop the recording and then can I start the recording again? Sure. So yes.